awesome. I hope you caught those words. No longer a slave to fear. That is awesome. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Appreciate you guys being here. Welcome back again. If you just joined us, I saw we have almost 100 people already filing in on YouTube and on Facebook. I want to ask you a question. You remember the last time you were truly scared? Because there she was, a terrified girl. Eyes were wide with fear. She slowly put one foot in front of the other, and she began walking up the stairs, and she was not happy about it. Now, you would think that she was walking up the stairs to some creepy haunted house, but in reality, she was walking up a dozen flight of stairs to something like this right here. You ever been on one of those? You're braver than I am if you've done that. This beautiful, precious, nine-year-old autistic girl was fighting back tears because she was climbing up what she thought she wanted to do. And as she was climbing this up, what would happen is you would get inside this, basically a tube, you would close the capsule around you, give a tentative thumbs up to the guy in control, and he would drop you, basically, to your doom. You would feel like you were dying. So rightfully so, she was kind of scared about this. She thought it was going to be a good idea, and things look different in the real world. I share this story because it's, it's from a friend of mine. Uh, you all know the, the great filmmaker Dallas Jenkins. He's produced some of these awesome movies, The Chosen that's out now streaming, Resurrection of Gavin Stone, What If, some of my all-time favorite movies. And Dallas and I have become friends on Facebook, and I asked him if I could have permission to share this story, and he, without hesitating, absolutely agreed. And so he said when she got to the top, she was terrified, and she kept trying. She'd get back into the pod, and then they'd close the door, and she'd freak out, say, no, 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 let me out, let me out. She'd come out. This happened three times. Three times she would shuffle in the pod, close the door, think about giving the thumb, no, I'm not giving the thumbs up, and then she'd say, I want out. And her dad would be there. But here's the deal. They had spoken about this while they were on the ground. And he looked into her eyes and said, sweetie, I will never force you to do this. You don't have to do this, but here's the deal. If we climb those stairs, the only way we're coming down is that slide. So you know the deal. Do you still want to do it? Yes, Dad, let's do this. So they get to the top, and at one point she started crying and even doing those self-soothing behaviors that, that my kids do and maybe yours do as well. And she started thinking, I can't do this. Daddy, please take me back downstairs. But he calmly and firmly said, baby, we're doing this. Just relax. Once you accomplish this, you are going to feel so good about yourself. A full half hour later of shuffling in and out of the tube, in and out of the pod, she finally gets in, closes the door, and gives the thumbs up. And she drops. Dallas, her dad, said this was one of the best moments of his life. His daughter, <laughs> not so much. She didn't enjoy it. She didn't like it. In fact, she said, I'm never doing that again. But he was so proud of her. And since that moment, they have been able to go back and refer to this moment of conquering fear time and time again. And it has been a powerful moment. Yeah, it's just a water slide, but here's the deal. This built her faith that she could trust her father. What a lesson for us. We can trust our heavenly father. What an awesome reminder. When we look around and people are frightened and they're buying up toilet paper and they're, they're clearing the shelves of stuff that they're probably not even going to need and they seem wide-eyed and panicked and, and there's a frenzy going on. They're looking for peace. They're looking for people, the church, to rise up and say, listen, hey, we understand fear. We get it. We're not saying ignore it. We're not saying minimize it. We're saying we're going to walk through this with the Prince of Peace. And it changes everything. And it's a beautiful reminder. So let me ask you this. What is your biggest fear? What is it that pops into your head? Chances are you have something in your mind right this moment that you're afraid of. For me, as a kid, this was my biggest fear. <clears throat> Michael Myers. <laughs> Y'all sitting at home, you know who this is, don't you? This used to freak me out. When Michael Myers would come on the screen, see, I grew up in the era of scary movies, you know what I'm talking about? And every time I would see this, my older brothers would be watching this, and I'd hear that music come on, that bee doo doo bee doo doo bee doo bee doo I'd be like, I, I'm, I'm gone, I'm out, I'm out. Now here's the deal. I'm no longer scared of him. He doesn't freak me out. 
You know why? Because Michael Myers has been unmasked. Let me show you what I mean. I did some research into this guy. Once I found out that this is nothing more than a William Shatner mask, a Captain Kirk mask that they bought at a hardware store because they didn't have a mask for the bad guys between this and a clown face, and they got it, and they enlarged the eyes, and then they spray painted it white just to make it creepy, kind of a blank canvas that you can project your fear on, which I would say was incredibly successful. Once I learned this was Captain Kirk, I'm not scared of him. He's, he's my, hey, buddy, how you doing? He's, he's so cute. He's just a cuddly guy. Why? Because fear has been unmasked. You go, Elliot, woo, fear has been unmasked. Fear is a liar. It takes things and distorts it and makes it so much bigger than what it is. In fact, my favorite old acronym, you've probably heard it a hundred times, is false evidence appearing real. So if fear isn't all it's cracked up to be, and it's, all, it's not all it's claims to be, why are we still so afraid? Why are people so freaked out today over a virus? A virus we can't see, but maybe we see the effects of. Well, if you're a student of God's Word, then you probably already know the answer to this. But if not, I want to show something here and cast a bright light on this. When are people most afraid? It's when they focus 100% on the problem right in front of them. When we take our eyes off of Christ and we focus on the problem and we minimize everything that's good and right and can help us and we maximize this huge issue and suddenly fear shows up when this person now is more focused on the situation than we are on God's sovereignty on how our Savior has conquered fear. He's conquered the grave. He's, death is nothing. What is the worst that can happen to me? What do we have, 70, 80, 90 years maybe? It's just a vapor. I'm just learning how to love the Lord, repent of my sins, and I, that's real life, the eternity to come. This is just a speck. And when you pull back and you have this, this holy perspective, you realize there's a good fear and there's a bad fear. The good fear is the fear of the Lord. And that is, that is this thing that we don't even talk about anymore. If somebody were to come and say, hey, are you walking in the fear of the Lord? Most of you say, I don't know. No, I don't know what that means. I mean, how would we answer Isaiah's question when he says, who among you fears the Lord? Because isn't all fear bad? I mean, what are we supposed to do? I thought fear was something we run from and we, don't, we, we reject or we say it's not there. We turn a blind eye to it. What is this fear of the Lord? Because people and churches that have a healthy fear and reverence of the Lord, they're the ones who are not easily shaken by circumstances. They're the ones that aren't freaking out. They're not the ones who think that this is the apocalypse. A healthy fear and a reverence of the Lord is an anchor during times of fear and trouble. So if you're here today and you're looking for some peace, you're in the right place. We are so, so glad to have you with us. Today we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 2. If you have a Bible, you're welcome to turn there. I'm going to read from the NKJV first. And if you don't have a Bible, we've got the words for you right here. Follow along, Proverbs chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 1. Look with me. It says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands... So that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, right? Not panic, not fear, but wisdom and understanding. If you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. That's powerful, but listen to how the message translation says it. Good friend, take to heart what I'm telling you. Collect my counsels and guard them with your life. Tune your ears to the world of wisdom. Set your heart on a life of understanding. That's right. If you make insight your priority and won't take no for an answer, searching for it like a prospector panning for gold, like an adventurer on a treasure hunt, believe me, before you know it, the fear of God will be yours. You'll have come upon the knowledge of God. Wow. That is why we're not shaken. That is how we are unflappable. Because we know the knowledge of God. We know who holds the world. We know how the whole story ends. See, in Old Testament times, there were two themes that ran all through the scriptures. These are two themes that, that summarize basically true faith. Twin pillars, almost like twin towers. And they're mentioned right here. The fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God. In other words, awe and reverence for the King of Kings and a friendship, an intimacy with the Lord. So let me ask a very simple but profound question. Do you want to be known as a fearless man of God? Do you want to be known as a fearless woman of God? If so, then we are told to walk in fear, but not the worldly fear. 
We are told to walk in the fear of the Lord. That's what the heroes of faith that we looked up to in Scripture did. Look at all these. Hebrews eleven seven. 7, Noah was moved with godly fear, and he built the ark because of that. The Proverbs 31 woman fears the Lord, even in the New Testament. Mary, the young virgin, says, fear the Lord. Mercy is on those who fear him. All throughout the book of Acts, we see this over and over. It's on every page. There's some kind of holy fear of God, continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Then fear came upon every soul, Acts 2. The apostle Paul, all the epistles, same theme. Paul says we're to submit to each other in the holy fear of God. And if that's not enough, all the way over in the end of the story, in Revelation, John tells us of a loud voice coming from the throne saying, praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him. There it is. So what has happened since then? How come we've replaced this holy fear with fear of man, with fear of virus, with fear of shrinking 401ks? Where is this godly fear? Where is it? Is it just for the Old Testament saints? Are they the only ones who are supposed to? How have we forgotten this subject in the modern church? And what does it mean to live in the fear of God? Well, I want to answer that. And to do that, you have to know what that kind of fear is and what fear isn't. And most of us, again, when we hear the word fear, we conjure up something in our head. So what is it that you're thinking of? What is it? What is your biggest fear? You've already got it. It's racing through your mind. Is it spiders? Is it snakes? What if I told you, oh my goodness, behind you on the seat, I see a spider on your wall. You need to get that. Is that a snake slithering out from under your sofa? What? See? Some of you are checking right now. You know you are. You're like, what? What? And those of you who aren't, you're feeling something crawling on your shoulder. Right? You're like, what's that? Get that on. I know it because that's what fear does. Tonight, I will probably have dreams about spiders. That's just the way we react to fear. Maybe for you, it's, it's something more cerebral, like fear of failure or fear of letting someone down. So when you hear the phrase fear of the Lord, does that mean we're supposed to live in a constant state of fright or concern or that God's going to spank us or zap us with some big lightning bolt from the sky if we get out of line? I'm not talking about that at all. Just like you love your children, you discipline them when they need it, but you don't disown them. You don't spank them for everything. I, I've got a, a, a friend who lives in Alabama, Roll Tide, and he has this thick southern drawl, and I love it. One day he was, we were with his kids, and they were getting out of hand, and they pushed it too far, and with his thick southern accent, he looks up and he says, y'all, I'm about to apply the hand of righteousness to the seed of knowledge. You better, you better stop it. And they straightened up. We have a lady in this church who's probably watching right now. I'm not going to name her. You'll probably figure it out. Awesome lady, loved their whole family. But she told me all she has to do when the kids get a little rowdy, or maybe the grandkids, she just raises that hand up. And if they don't notice, she just starts to shake it just a little, just a little tremble. And it's almost like a Jedi mind trick. They stop, and they feel, Grandma's got the hand going. And that's it. I mean, it's just amazing. It's like a miracle. All you got to do is shake that hand, and they straighten right up. What, what, what is it that makes us do that? See, that's not the fear we're talking about today. That's the fear of man. God's not calling us to live a life of fear where he's going to spank us with his strong, mighty hand of discipline if we don't cross every T or dot every I. Having a fear of the Lord simply means this. It means having a sense of absolute awe and respect. It is the, the highest level, the, the utmost reverence that you can possibly have. That's the common word throughout Scripture that we use is this fear. It means revering God. It becomes the controlling motivation of our lives. Fearing God is like living with this awareness of his presence to where you don't want to do anything to disappoint him. You don't want to do anything to bring displeasure to your heavenly father who loves us so much. All right, so what am I saying? Am I saying that you have to earn his blessing? You have to like behave a certain way to get his approval or maybe you lose your salvation. I'm not talking about that at all. Let's, let's bring this into a, a, a hypothetical, a truly hypothetical situation. Let's say Friday night I put on a ski mask and I go rob a bank. And I take that money and I fly to Vegas overnight and I blow it all on all kinds of horrible stuff. And I'm, I'm running around on my wife, I'm doing drugs, and I, I fly back home and I'm mad at the kids, I kick the dog, and then I'm hungover, I, I, I finish off two cases of Everclear, and I come bebopping into the pulpit to bring the word. Now let me ask you something. Do you think I have any right to expect God's hand of blessing or favor on me when I preach? No way. 
There's no way. Now, he doesn't disown me. He doesn't say, that's it. Pack your bags. Get out. Hey, it's not like that. Just like you don't do that to your kids when they break a window or do something that disappoints you. Don't disown them. It's just my fellowship with my heavenly father has been severed. I've broken that. The sun is, is the Lord. He's still shining. I'm still here on earth, but a cloud has moved between us. Is the sun still shining? Absolutely. I hadn't changed anything. Sun's still there. I'm still here. It's just my fellowship with him is broken. The world has darkened a little bit. So here's what the, the result we're looking for. Living with the awareness of a fear of God makes us so different in what we do, what we say, where we go, how we live our lives. This is the secret to having peace and being unflappable, to having that security when the world seems to be falling apart all around us because he is a loving, heavenly father. He is our Abba. That's what Jesus called him, our Abba Father. That literally, Abba means Daddy. And when you think about your Heavenly Father like that, that you could curl up in his lap and say, Daddy, I'm kind of scared. The world seems to be losing their minds, and I don't have any toilet paper. What am I going to do? And he, he wraps his arms around you. That's why we love to worship, because we sense his presence in here. He wants to have that unbroken fellowship with us. I just read a story this week about Elizabeth, who was a, a three-year-old, and she's riding in the car with her mom, and she's got her favorite doll, who she calls Stacy, and her favorite book. And they're riding down the, the, the highway, and her mom's in the front seat, she's looking in the rearview mirror, and she's driving, and little Elizabeth's in the back seat, she's got her favorite book, she's got Stacy here, and she's, you know, reading to her, pretending to read, and looking up, and then she asks her mom the most crazy question, out of the blue, she says, Mama, what's the first thing you're going to do when you get to heaven? And her mom, she's used to crazy questions, but this one caught her off guard. She didn't really have an answer, so she kind of mumbled something, you know, semi-spiritual, like, well, I'm probably going to find my family and my loved ones and rejoice and celebrate, things like that. Well, that wasn't good enough for little Elizabeth. Little Elizabeth looked down and said, not me. You know what I'm going to do, Mama? I'm going to find Jesus. And I'm going to take Stacy, and we're going to crawl into his lap, curl up, and let the Lord read us a story. Wow. That is a girl who has no fear in her heart because it's so full of Jesus. It's so full of childlike innocence and love. There's no fear there. She's happy to be where the Father is. She knows that is her destiny. She, she has, there is nothing foreign or vague. She's not thinking of heaven as some distant home on a cloud where you're a fat little cupid with a harp and you're doing stuff like on... That's, that's not what awaits us. We have eternal perspective here. There is no room for fear. Romans 8.31 says this, if God is for us, who could be against us? What a great question. What is it that we have let get so far out of perspective that we fear it more than God? What is it? What is it that's dominating your thoughts this morning? What is it that we have allowed to grow and become this monster in front of us that we can no longer see past it to see our Heavenly Father saying, everything will work out. One way or the other, you are going to be okay. If you know the Savior, stop worrying. Yeah, be smart. Yeah, use common sense. I've washed my hands so many times, they hurt. And I'm going to continue to do that. And we should. And listen to the professionals. But we don't need to be the ones who are panicking because we have a peace that passes all understanding. All right, so now we know what the fear of the Lord is. How do we walk in that today? As we leave this place here, how do we know? How do we, how do we walk and do this diligently? Well, we begin the same place we begin in the Christian life with anything, in his word. We look right here. I know we got a lot of computer programmers that are streaming with us today and a few here in the room that know computers. And if you began coding when you were younger then you remember those great languages like Pilot and COBOL and Fortran and BASIC. And one of the very first things you learn to program is the if-then statement. If you're not sure about what that is, that's basically, if this is true, then go do this. You're telling the computer if x equals 7, then go to line 20 or subroutine this. And it's a very simple thing. If this happens, then go do this. Well, King Solomon just gave us the most incredible if-then statement. The wisest man who's ever lived the wealthiest man who has ever lived, said this. I want you to notice how many times he says if before he finally gets to then. Look with me again. He says, my son, if you receive my words and if you cry out for discernment, 
And if you seek her as silver, searching for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. Now, I want to issue a warning about that right there. If you cry out for discernment like that, be careful, you just might get it. You might get a dump truck full of discernment coming on. Your eyes may be opened. And when you're reading his word, when you go to him, whether it's through prayer or, or you're reading the Bible, or you sense the Holy Spirit speaking to you, and he's wanting to change something in your life, don't resist it. Don't be fearful. Embrace it. If you truly desire to be fearless, if you truly desire to have the mind of Christ and you're asking for guidance, now is not the time to be defensive. Now is not the time to be afraid. You can't be defensive if the Holy Spirit is telling you something, if he's beginning to work on you to make, him, make you more like his son. Let me, let me show you what I mean. There's, this, this is kind of a, a little heads up. This is a little bit of a gross story in this day and age of the coronavirus and people not, not being uh, hygienically clean, shall we say. Dr. Gerald Hickson works in a very famous hospital. I'm going to name it in just a minute, but I want you to see if you can guess. Gerald Hickson's wife just had double knee surgery. So she's in the hospital, replaced all of her knee and all that stuff, and it's, it's going to be a long recovery. And so he said, you know what? I'm not going to leave her alone. I'm going to camp in her room. Now remember, he's a doctor too. So he's laying in that uncomfortable recliner, and he's there, and he's making sure she gets all the medication she needs, making sure she gets up and walking around to avoid blood clots, and, and he's just going to monitor some things. He thought that was going to be his problem that he would focus on. Boy, were his eyes open. He was shocked. His own team in the hospital, he got a pad and paper, and he counted 92 times that doctors and nurses walked in and went straight to treating his wife without washing their hands or sanitizing them. Now, that's gross to us. Like, oh, okay, you know. But to this guy, he is the senior vice president of safety and risk prevention at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. I could make some weird joke and say, you know, he wrote the book on this. He literally wrote the book on this. Look at this. This is the guy who wrote Clean Hands Saves Lives, Gerald Hickson, Hand Hygiene Committee and Leadership Review Task Force. That sounds like a fun person to hang out with. This guy, he is the ultimate germaphobe. So imagine his horror when he's sitting there and people are parading in and out 92 times walking right up to his wife, examining her open incisions, and he says, time out. And he reminds them, have you forgotten something? Out of the 92 people who came in and out, how many do you think actually stopped, sanitized, and washed their hands? Two-thirds of the doctors and nurses never did. He said, in fact, he counted 32 times they actually did. So naturally, he stepped in and said, time out. You need to go sanitize and wash your hands before you even think of treating my wife. Now, here's where this is going. The responses of these 92 people was shocking. He knew them. He said some of them at first were naturally embarrassed and they became defensive. In fact, some tried to give excuses for every reason in the world why they didn't sanitize their hands. But he said there was another group, sadly a smaller group, that was grateful. And they were I'm so sorry. Thank you. And they corrected their mistake and took measures to make sure it didn't happen again. Let me ask you something. Between those two responses, which group of people do you think is more likely to repeat their mistake again and again? It's the defensive ones. It's the ones that didn't accept correction. They refused it. And that is a lesson for us. In order to become more like Christ, we have to accept his correction. Don't reject it. It's for our good. Defensiveness to correction is a sign that we've got pride. Something is wrong. We think we're better. We, maybe we can't fail. Or maybe we've attached our self-worth to being perfect. And then when we fail, we feel like we've, we've, we're, we're less than perfect. And we've dropped the ball. So let's take a little test, okay? You don't have to answer out loud. I know you're at home. You've got your little cute little footy pajamas on and stuff. How did you react the last time someone corrected you? Can you remember? Were you defensive? Or were you grateful? Did you make excuses to prove your self-worth to everyone? You ever know someone who's a know-it-all? <laughs> Don't you love them? 
They're just, they're, they're hard to love, man. They have the personality of a sunburn, and they're as cuddly as a cactus, but we're called to love them. Know-it-alls get on my nerves. I remember growing up learning a painful lesson. In my house, we played a lot of Monopoly, and then we played Risk. You ever played Risk? You know what I'm talking about? A little war strategy thing? And my older brothers, I looked up to them, and I was the youngest of three. We had Jeff, Tim, and then way down here was me. And they would invite their friends over to play Monopoly and Risk. And one day they were there at the kitchen table, gathered around, and they were all playing, having a good time. And I would kind of sneak up, sit at the table, and I'd look at them and be like, hey, guys. And they'd start having these conversations, and I would chip in a comment here or there. And if they'd ask a question, man, I had the answer. Boom, I was ready. And I would answer these questions. And then finally, apparently, I must have overdone it because I could even tell you the names of my brother's older friend, Mark Matoza and John Rodenberg. Wow. Hello, guys, if you're watching. They stopped the game, and Mark Matoza looked at me, and he said, what's it like? I was like, what? what's what like? He says, what's it like, Matt, to, to know everything at, at such a young age? What's it like to know everything at age nine? It must be awesome. Is it awesome? Y'all, that went right over my head back then. I know what he means today. I was a know-it-all. And I was, if somebody tried to correct me or give me something, I would reject it. And that is not what God is calling us to do. We're to walk humbly in the fear of the Lord with soft hearts that are easily molded by the maker. That's why we're the potter's hand. He is the potter. We're the clay. He's able to mold us and make us whichever way he chooses. Now, here's a hidden bonus. There are benefits to walking in the fear of the Lord. Did you know that? There are benefits. All throughout Proverbs, you will notice every time fear is mentioned, there's a benefit that follows it. Nearly every time. Check it out. Here's just a few from Proverbs alone. The fear of the Lord adds length to life. Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress. Their kids will be safe. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. It prevents you going to the snares of death. The fear of the Lord leads to life. You rest content. Anybody want contentment? Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. So here's the bottom line. This is the sobering truth. Far too many of us as followers of Christ are not walking in the fear of the Lord. So today, drive a stake in the ground. Say, I'm done. I rebuke that. I'm not going to fall. I am, I'm not going to worry. I'm going to pray. I'm going to seek him. I know he has things. It's not that he's in control. He's above control. He's sovereign. It is all going to end the way he has blessed it to be. Deemed today, re resolved today, like those great saints who went on before. We are going to walk in the fear of the Lord. And when you do that, here's another hidden gem. Something mysterious happens. Something un unbelievable that we, we gloss over. Here's your hidden gem. Psalm 25 says, The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him. He will whisper the secrets to you. He'll show you his covenant. A secret with God? Are you kidding me? A secret with God, the holy, radiant, all-powerful creator of the cosmos, wants to have secrets with me when we walk in the fear of the Lord? Uh, yes, please. Sign me up for some of that. I want to know that. We all want to know the secret. We love secrets. Secrets are powerful. In fact, I'm going to end with this story. Instrumentalists, you guys can come back up. We're going to get ready to, to have our final song, and, and we'll pray. Does anyone remember what happened December 7th, 1941? Pearl Harbor. Y'all remember this? America was devastated. We saw the power of a well-guarded secret when the Royal Japanese Navy attacked Pearl Harbor and surprised us. Over 2,400 Americans lost their lives. And after the surprise attack that Japan did on Pearl Harbor, for a while, it seemed that these Japanese were always one step ahead of us. Like, almost like we couldn't figure out how they were guessing our next move. And it was so bizarre. And then we found out why. They knew our secrets. They knew our secrets. They had cracked our code. They'd been able to decode our military messages and some of our detailed war strategy. How? Because Japanese students had been studying our words. They'd been studying our language, living in the U.S., studying here, and they could speak fluent English, so they were able to decode messages fairly easily. So a few months later, 1942, of February, a World War I vet named Philip Johnston had a great idea that the Japanese couldn't decode. Philip was the son of Christian missionaries to the Navajo Reservation. So he grew up there, and he knew the people, and he knew their language, and he knew it was so complex. In fact, there are less than 30 people on the planet that are non-Navajo that can even speak it, let alone write it. 
That's how incredible their language was. So he wrote a letter to the U.S. government and said, I've got an idea. I think this might work. What if we base our whole coding system on a language no one has ever heard? No one knows what would happen. And it changed the whole direction of the entire war. Philip, along with 29 Navajo men, were recruited to use this complex language to develop a code that was never broken. It was never deciphered during the war. In fact, it was so good, it held, it held the secret for 25 more years. 25 years, they couldn't do it. This secret was so good. If it weren't for these Navajo code talkers and this closely guarded secret, the Marines likely would have never taken the island of Iwo Jima. That's how powerful knowing the secret is. But you've got to spend time with the Lord. Psalm 25 says, The secret of the Lord is for those who fear Him. Hear me. It says who fear Him. Not fear man. Not fear sickness. Not fear a disease. Not fear a shrinking 401k. Not fear a, a toilet paper suff, uh, shortage. Fear Him. And all these other things will grow strangely dim. They'll fade away. I'm not saying they'll disappear, but they will fade into the background because you are gazing into the Prince of Peace. And when you stop and you pause and you do that, it changes everything. The reason I love Proverbs is because it, it's almost like perfect bookends. It begins with the most famous verse you've heard. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's where you start. But it ends all the way over in chapter 31 about a woman who fears the Lord, and she's praised for it. She's respected. When the troubled times come, they seek her out because she's respected. And her husband's respected at the city gates, it says. That's what we want to be. We want to be that lighthouse. A woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. This is perfect bookends. The Proverbs begins with the fear of the Lord, and it ends with it. And this isn't an accident because he is the beginning and the end. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is the first and the last. And to have a proper fear and reverence for the Lord, you must first know the Lord. So you know i got to ask, do you? Do you know him? Not know about him, not grow up in church and kind of have an idea about him, but do you have an intimate friendship with God? Do you feel like he's your Abba, your Daddy, your, your Heavenly Father? We're like Elizabeth we, we talked about almost feel like you can curl up in his lap and be a child again and say, you know what, I'm a, I'm a little frightened right now. Would you just call him my fears, Father? That's the relationship he gives you. That's why you look around and you see some people of faith are unflappable. Not because of us. It's because of him living in us. He gives us that peace. If you've never met him, you don't really have a relationship with him or a friendship, you can today. Would you bow with me? Let's pray together. Just close your, close your eyes and bow your head wherever you are. Maybe you're seated in your home. Maybe you're upstairs on your computer. Just tune out all the distractions. Father, you said in your word that you don't want any to perish, but you want everyone to come to repentance, to know you, our awesome, loving, forgiving God. Lord, you said that we need to confess our sin and agree with you, that it is hideous and it is what severed our, our, our relationship with you. So, Lord, we, we, we don't hide anything. You read us like an open book. We bring it out in the open. We say, God, forgive us. We know we've done things that have disappointed you or hurt you or hurt others. Would you forgive us? Even though we don't deserve it, we can't earn it, Lord, would you forgive us? We're sorry. Holy Spirit, would you cleanse our heart, cleanse my life, invade my core, become the Lord, the Savior that I've needed, Lord, I'm tired of living for myself. I've made a mess. I've, I, I keep going off these tangents. Lord, I want to I focus. I want that peace. I want to be unflappable when the rest of the world seems to be falling apart. I want the peace that Jesus showed when he walked the earth. Father, would you give us that? Thank you for your promise that anyone who calls on your name will be saved, that you will seal our heart for the day of redemption, that we are part of your family based on your word. I thank you for that promise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you didn't leave us in our sin, but you provided a way. You sent a perfect sacrifice in the form of Jesus to take our sin. The perfect God-man who did nothing wrong yet took everything I've ever done wrong and put it on himself so you could see me as blameless. We accept that sacrifice. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that. 
We pray in your name this morning. Amen.